but we're doing our best to stay on schedule. But clearly, as the months go by, I will keep the Chamber and the industry up to date in terms of the payment schedule. Many thanks. And we now have to move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12869 in the name of Christina McKelvey on EU engagement and scrutiny of the Committees of the Scottish Parliament on the European Union Policies 2015 to 2016. I'd invite members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now and I call on Christina McKelvey to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the European and External Relations Committee. Ten minutes or thereby, please, Ms McKelvey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I am very pleased to open this debate as Convener of the European and External Relations Committee on our annual report of the EU engagement and scrutiny of committees of this Scottish Parliament. This debate shows that we as, a, as Scottish parliamentarians take EU matters very, very seriously. And I was very pleased to see that the range and variety and depth of other committees' reports to our committee this year reflect that fact. My committee leads, as you know, on the Parliament's EU strategy for committees. We act as a mainstreaming hub, actively encouraging our fellow committees to strengthen their work with a wider European context and engage early on with issues of importance in the EU to Scotland. This year, I believe we have been successful in that aim again. I intend to outline briefly how we have achieved that. But before I do, I would like to thank sincerely the other eight participating committees for their ongoing engagement and the reports to my committee. Um, can I also pay tribute to the clerks of the EU and External, Re External Relations Committee uh, for the work that, that they do, which has been very intense uh, over the past year. So, presiding officer, since our last debate, we have had elections for the European Parliament in May 2014. In late 2014, we've seen the formation of the new College of Commissioners in the European Commission, led by President Juncker, who presented a new look, streamlined commission work programme for 2015. Looking ahead, the UK elections campaign has featured EU issues more than ever before, not least in the context of the possibility of an in and out referendum. So with all of that as a backdrop, I'm really glad we have this opportunity to share how we and other parliamentary committees have engaged in EU issues over the last year and what our future EU scrutiny priorities are. This will be our last such debate for the current parliamentary session. So we asked other committees about their engagement on EU policies in 2014 and what they are planning to do in 2015 and in early 2016 until the end of this session. Yeah, we didn't realise it was coming that quick, did we? Um, we asked committees to identify their priorities in relation to three main areas. And these three main areas are the Europe 2020 Agenda, the Scottish Government's Action Plan for EU Engagement and the European Commission's Work Programme. So I'd like to focus on the European Commission's Work Programme for 2015 or the CWP 2015 as it's known in the Europhile community and uh, including my committee's consideration of its new approach. The approach of CWP 2015 is to focus on a limited number of 23 new initiatives for 2015, a lower number than was the case under the previous College of Commissioners. Additionally, the new Commission also proposes to withdraw 80 pending pieces of legislation. So we could scrutinise and better understand the implications of this new approach. The European and External Relations Committee took evidence from the Commission directly. The Commission told us it wanted to focus on priorities and on results and invest in proposals that would have the biggest impact on jobs and growth. We also took the opportunity to ask the Commission how the new Commission was connecting with European <coughs> citizens and making its work accessible and comprehensible. We also have work... Um, we also heard that work was being undertaken to make the Commission website more accessible. I'm sure my colleague Willie Coffey will be delighted with that and other initiatives to make its work much more transparent. But the Commission also acknowledged that it, and I quote, needs to take measures to restore trust, a sentiment which our committee entirely agrees with. In our report, we have asked the Commission to keep us updated on how it progresses in this area, and I hope that a future European Committee can report in further years on that very progress. Given the changes in the Commission last year and the streamlined nature of the Commission's work programme for 2015, there were fewer opportunities for committees to engage with the work programme this year. But I am sure this will change in the five years of this Commission, as more initiatives and policies are rolled out which uh, we can then scrutinise. 
We gathered useful evidence from various different perspectives so that we could report to Parliament on what Team Scotland collectively thinks the priorities for Scotland and the CWP 2015 are. And I would like to thank all of those uh, sources who gave us their views and their insights. Namely, we had all of Scotland's six MEPs, the Scottish Government, and finally, not forgetting, Stuart Maxwell and Patricia Ferguson, um, in particular Stuart's uh, report um, with his uh, Scottish Parliament member of the Committee of the Regions hat on um, to our committee, which was very insightful and helpful indeed. In summary, we heard that the CWP initiative's importance for Scotland included the digital single market, the energy union, the internal market, the capital markets union and the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, widely known as TTIP. I'm going to pick out just one of those, which is the Digital Single Market Initiative, to give you a flavour of the work our committee has, on, has done on the CWP. I will also come back to TTIP later in the context for more detailed work we have been doing in the committee. The committee has been following the Digital Single Market Initiative avidly for some time now, particularly I pay tribute to Willie Coffey, who has never allowed an opportunity to raise this at a committee um, at any point uh, to be lost, um, and I commend him for his very insightful work on that too. Uh, we were keen to seek um, assurance from the Commission that the Digital Single Market Initiative would improve issues in Scotland, such as bringing uniform broadband coverage to remote areas like the Highlands and Islands. And I'm sure my colleague Jamie McGregor would be delighted to hear that as well. It's one of his hobby horses that he likes to uh, keep pressing. We also highlighted our concerns that the final EU budget agreed by the Council and the European Parliament reduces the Connecting Europe budget, which could impact on the digital agenda. The Commission told us that its new investment plan was intended to provide funding for projects such as rural broadband and that this new plan would not mean less money for digital infrastructure. As you can imagine, we were quite interested in that. However, we have noted in our report that we are not entirely satisfied with the level of information available from the Commission on the aims of the digital single market. Given its importance to Scotland, I would like to reassure Parliament that our committee will continue to monitor any key developments and assess how the digital single market might benefit Scotland. So turning to the other areas of importance for the committee, some committees have uh, declared their intention to consider aspects of the Europe 2020 strategy. This is the EU's 10-year growth strategy for boosting sustainable economic growth and creating new jobs. As in previous years, committees can directly input into the strategy via the Scottish Government's National Reform Programme, which set out the distinct approach in Scotland. Similarly, the relevant committees will be considering the priorities identified in the Scottish Government's action plan for EU engagement. The plan describes its focus being in four main areas, which are being a committed EU partner, promoting EU reform, active participation and strengthening partnerships. So in summary, we can see how uh, the work of the committees on EU scrutinises both the bigger picture of the CWP and also the specific Scottish perspective of EU initiatives. I am not going to dwell on specific topics that each committee has prioritised. No doubt that will be covered by my colleagues for those committees in the debates. And I know um, Hanzala Malik, our Deputy Convener, will reflect her colleagues' contributions to the debate as it unfolds. On the other hand, I would like to take the opportunity to briefly highlight some of the committee's main areas of work from 2014 and 2015 thus far. Our recent inquiry on TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, has been of great interest. To a backdrop of many discussion events on TTIP more generally being organised by various organisations throughout Scotland, Scotland's trade unions and the active group from St Andrews University, I was very pleased to host one such event recently here on, in the Parliament, which was organised by the Hansard Society on behalf of the European Parliament. It was a sold-out event very quickly with a room full of active and well-informed participants. In fact, there is so much heated public engagement on TTIP that we thought it only right to request a chamber debate, which I think is taking place very, very soon. As I am sure colleagues will be well aware, TTIP is a trade agreement that is being negotiated by the EU and the USA. 
In fact, the ninth round of negotiations are taking place right now in New York from the 20th to the 24th of April. The key issues which our committee has heard evidence on include the transparency of negotiations, a very important aspect, the economic benefits of any agreement, the potential inclusion of investor state dispute mechanism, settlement mechanism and the impact of TTIP on public services. Moving on to a different topic, in 2014, we began a major four-part inquiry called Connecting Scotland, how Scotland can engage more effectively with the globalised world. We have started that inquiry already with evidence from uh, representatives from Catalan, Basque and Flemish governments to give us a wider perspective. The next phase of that inquiry will consider how non-governmental and third sector organisations in Scotland engage both in the EU and internationally. We will be bringing a wide range of organisations from the third sector, local government and civil society, universities and colleges to find out what they do. In closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope that the Parliament finds our report of interest and I look forward to hearing thoughts and views from colleagues on all EU subjects across um, areas this afternoon. Presiding Officer, I move that the Parliament notes the European and External Relations Committee first report 2015, session 4, EU engagement and scrutiny of the committees of the Scottish Parliament on the European Union 2015-16. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Humza Yousaf. Ministry of Seven Minutes, or thereby, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank uh, the convener, Christina McKelvey, uh, for setting out the conclusions of the EERC's report. Uh, before I go into the detail uh, discussion about that report, it would be remiss of me um, when we are doing a, a discussion on uh, the EU uh, not to begin uh, by giving the Scottish Government's very uh, heartfelt and sincere condolences over the uh, issues that we've seen in the last uh, couple of weeks with the dreadful uh, drownings in the Mediterranean. Our resolve as the Scottish Government to play a constructive role in helping those that are being smuggled uh, has got stronger. It's an issue that the Scottish Government and Cabinet Secretary uh, Fiona Hislop has been involved in for not just a number of months, uh, but actually even longer than that. And we hope that as a, as a continent, uh, as, a, as a multilateral institution, the EU can come together. We must not turn a blind eye to those who are the most vulnerable uh, in the world. Um, we must ensure that we do all that we can to help them, to support them. And this is, above and beyond anything else, a humanitarian issue. Uh, I very much welcome uh, this report uh, from the committee presiding officer, and particularly the fact that many of the committees have mainstreamed uh, consideration of EU issues into their existing work programmes. I think that's to be welcomed. I spoke last month in the government's debate on the importance of EU engagement and said out why that engagement is important, not just in the context of influencing the rules and the regulations which are made in the EU, but also in the context of acknowledging that the European Union is a marketplace, a marketplace for exchanging ideas, for showcasing where Scotland can display leadership, or where indeed Scotland can learn uh, from others as well. I want to formally acknowledge uh, the important work that the committee has undertaken of late and add my thanks also to the, those behind the scenes, as the convener did often the, the committee clerks, uh, in getting, uh, the, in getting the, the, the workings of the committee uh, to run extremely smoothly and efficiently. Uh, this work includes, of course, last year's inquiry into the Scottish Government's proposals for an independent Scotland. I think we can all agree whichever side of the fence people sat on uh, in that debate, it was important that those proposals receive the full uh, and considered scrutiny of our committees. Uh, we as a government will also continue to cooperate closely with the committees connecting Scotland uh, inquiry. I also welcome uh, the committee's more recent report, uh, as the convener reflected, on TTIP, which broadly aligns uh, with the government's own view as well. Transparency is, of course, critical in the context of the existing TTIP negotiations. As the committee heard themselves, there are different views on the economic benefits and possible economic benefits of TTIP, and if there are benefits, but we are clear they must not be at the expense of the NHS and other public services or indeed the rights of governments to regulate. That is why the Scottish Government has pressed firmly and strongly for an explicit exemption of the NHS and is not currently convinced that the ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement Mechanism, uh, is necessary. I'm also encouraged by the work programmes going forward, which other committees have identified, which have EU issues at their core. This includes important work on rolling out the new CAP and CFP packages, where I think the simplification agenda uh, will certainly be key. Uh, the Commission's EU 2020 strategy, which has already been touched on, 
uh, which seeks to promote smart, sustainable and inclusive growth, chimes very closely with the Scot Scottish Government's own programme for government and also our refreshed economic strategy with the key themes of tackling unemployment and reducing income inequality at their core. For the last four years, Scotland has produced its own national reform programme report in, addi in addition to contributing uh, to the UK, UK's uh, governments as well. These reports have given a sense of how Scotland is performing against some of those very important key targets set out in the 2020 strategy in terms of, uh, for example, uh, in terms of employment and reducing poverty, uh, cutting the number of early school leavers. We will we'll publish our 2015 report following the UK general election, which has been uh, informed by a successful stakeholder event that we held in March, uh, in, March in Edinburgh. Uh, last month, on a visit to West Brewery in the constituency I represent uh, of, of Glasgow, the region I represent in Glasgow, I visited uh, a fantastic company. And many uh, colleagues here might be familiar with West Brewery, owned by. Uh, it's a great success story, not just in itself, but actually represents why we're so proud of uh, and engaged in, as members of the EU, because it's owned by a German national who came to study uh, here in Scotland. Uh, she then, Petra Westall, then went on to start her business. Uh, her brewery, her staff has half a dozen uh, EU uh, nationals and is brewing a craft beer, a beer uh, which is being uh, uh, using a German purity law from 1519. And it has all these uh, various components uh, that I think uh, underscore the importance of freedom of movement and freedom of travel. But while I was at West Brewery, uh, I was there to launch, of course, the Scottish Government's action plan uh, for EU engagement, which refreshes uh, the original action plan launched in 2009. The four key areas that the convener uh, helpfully touched upon, uh, I will go into a little bit of detail. Firstly, that we want to remain, of course, a committed partner and make the case for our place in Europe. I believe there's consensual support, consensus of support around this chamber for the UK uh, and indeed Scotland, of course, to remain uh, a, part, a member of the EU for the business benefits that it brings, for the social benefits, for the cultural benefits and the educational and academic uh, benefits it brings. Secondly, we'll continue to promote effective and meaningful EU reform within the existing treaty framework. And key to that is ensuring that the EU institutions pursue an agenda that is genuinely, uh, genuinely adds value and addresses some of the EU-wide problems that member states acting alone could not. That's why we welcome the focus from the Commission on tackling things like stubbornly high uh, youth unemployment or indeed promoting energy security through the energy union package, tackling climate change and so on and so forth. Uh, third area of the action plan centres around active participation, actively participating in the EU in order to secure investment, innovation and inclusive growth. And I can go more into that uh, in my closing speech. And fourthly, uh, we're committed to strengthening our European partnerships going forward uh, which will do, continue to work to deepen our bilateral relationships with countries, including, uh, but not exclusively, uh, Germany, France, the Nordic and Baltic countries, uh, Ireland and Poland. Poland. The action plan is currently on a digital platform, which allows it to be evolving, allows it to, to be updated. It captures real-life case studies uh, as, as, as well, and I hope that members here uh, have had a chance uh, to look at it. I'm pleased. Uh, to read that the EERC uh, has asked other committees to identify their priority areas for 2015-16 from the EU 2020 strategy, uh, the Commission Work Programme for 2015 and the Scottish Government's Action Plan on European Engagement. I'll conclude, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, by saying that members, of course, will be in no doubt about our position when it comes to uh, an EU in-out referendum. Uh, we will be passionately uh, advocating the benefits of being part of Europe. We don't agree with the necessity uh, for having uh, this EU in-out referendum, but if it does happen, we hope that the UK government, in whichever form it may take, in May the 7th, May the 8th, uh, will uh, look at our proposals for a double majority. The Scottish Government uh, very much is committed to anchoring its own economic strategy firmly to the EU's growth agenda and delivering sustainable, smart, but fair economic growth. Many thanks. And I now call on Claire Baker. Five minutes or thereby, please, Ms Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. I'd like to welcome the committee debate on Parliament's engagement with the European Union. Um, our committees do not often grab the headlines of the Scottish Parliament, but it is where much of the serious work of the Parliament takes place. Um, the European and External Affairs Committee have an important role in coordinating and scrutinising the European aspect of other committees' work. And the report we are looking at today provides an excellent overview of the areas these committees are focusing on. 
um, from previous parliamentary work. I know the importance of Europe to the Rural Affairs and Environment Committee in particular, where decisions made in Europe have a significant impact on our rural economy, our fishing sector, and the Scottish Government's attempts to meet our climate change targets. Um, and I note the detailed report um, from that committee. Uh, the report today also provides a discussion of the European Commission's work programme, um, the 10 priority areas and the European 2020 strategy, as well as outlining its own work programme for the year ahead. Um, the Parliament has always been supportive of our engagement with Europe. Um, the European Committee, in its various forms over the years, has always had MSPs who champion the importance of Europe um, to Scotland. With our focus on domestic affairs um, and our recent focus on our own constitution and referendum, we can often be at risk of losing sight of the, of the bigger picture. Um, in here, within the Parliament, we might be focused on the detail of European directives or legislation, but we don't always do a good job of relating that to the public in their everyday lives. The turnout at European elections is historically low and the public do often struggle to see the relevance of European policy. Yet so much of our European policy does improve, um, which works to improve our air quality, our water quality, and um, promotes biodiversity, does often originate in Europe. Uh, much of our positive workplace legislation and regulations around maternity and paternity pay, hours at work, um, these all start in Europe, although there's still much to do in terms of achieving consistency across member states. Um, human rights and equalities laws are strengthened and enforced by Europe. And one look at the priorities of the Commission show how important they can be. Developing a resilient energy union with a forward-looking climate change programme, a connected digital single market, a new boost for jobs, growth and investment are just three of the Commission's priorities. Of course, these are um, high-level objectives and there will still be a lot of debate around how these can be achieved, debates which this report today does demonstrate our committees are engaged with. But these priorities are aiming at collective action, at strengthening the European Union in areas which are sensible and can bring benefits to Member States. Um, I welcome the Committee's questions to the Commission on Engagement with European Citizens and making its work sufficiently accessible and comprehensive. There is a lot of work to do here. Um, while measures such as a more accessible website, social media, a transparency register are all welcome, there is a much greater cultural change needed if the Commission, in its own words, wants to restore trust. There does need to be tougher budget discipline, especially around potential waste and inefficiency of EU agencies. And we must be prepared to look at where spending at the EU level can help save money at a national level. We must also look at continuing to open up the decision-making process at an EU level, implementing institutional reforms to help build levels of trust among European citizens and ensure greater parliamentary scrutiny and accountability. Uh, this is a short debate, but there is much content in the report. I do note that the committee observed that the level of European engagement for 2015-16 has declined compared to 2014, and I do support their encouragement for committees and their EU reporters to actively engage. However, I'm sure we will return to many of the subjects in greater detail as the committees progress through their work programmes, which do focus on a number of the Commission's ten priorities. Indeed, next week we are anticipating the opportunity to discuss the committee's inquiry um, into TTIP in more detail. Um, we are living in an increasingly global world with strong, competitive emerging markets and economies. Europe as a trading bloc needs to build new partnerships if it is to be competitive and create opportunities for its citizens. But Europe has never just been about trade. It is about partnership, solidarity, fairness and about peace. The heightening of the migrant crisis in the Mediterranean in recent weeks, as referred to by the Minister, does present new and complex challenges for Europe. But we must be guided by the principles which created the Union when we are looking for solutions. Europe needs to respond to the modern world and address issues of sustainability, economic fairness and stability, and human rights and our role in the world. These are the big challenges and it is important that this Parliament engages with that future. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Liz Smith, a generous five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, could I begin by uh, sending the apologies of my colleague, uh, Jamie McGregor, who is unfortunately ill uh, he wants to send his apologies to you, Deputy Presiding Officer, to the convener and to other uh, colleagues. Uh, he asked me to begin by thanking the clerks for compiling the report uh, that, as Claire Baker has just said, uh, has a lot of content in it, in fact, very interesting report, 
uh, and quite rightly, uh, the committees of this Parliament uh, do a great deal to ensure that the uh, full commitment to EI, EU priorities is undertaken. And I think we would uh, all agree in this Parliament that our committees are in one form or another uh, impacted quite heavily by European affairs and legislation, some of which I think can be extremely complex, perhaps some of the most complex legislation anywhere. And so I'm uh, sure that it is a difficult job for the clerks at times and the conveners to help us uh, decide how we should actually proceed with effective scrutiny. I think it's all extremely important for us to consider how the EU uh, works, what works well for Scotland and where it perhaps does not work quite so well. Uh, the Scottish Parliament's Committee's EU strategy, which is now in its uh, fifth year, also plays an important part in scrutinising the Scottish Government's EU engagement. And I pay tribute to the uh, Committee for drawing together all these uh, strands in the way that uh, Christina McKelvey has outlined and acting, I think, as a hub uh, for the Scottish Parliament as it goes through its business. I think there are some very interesting issues uh, thrown up by discussion about the EU. Uh, perhaps more of that in my uh, summing up. Quite clearly, this report has uh, led to a wide range of uh, topics being discussed, uh, and it uh, does show just how much they underpin all the work of this place. I was interested uh, to note particularly about the uh, very significant uh, evidence that was taken at the time uh, of Scotland's possible membership of the EU should there have been uh, an, a yes vote in the referendum. And I don't want to rehash any of the politics of that, but I'm aware of just how many of the uh, politicians and members of uh, academia uh, came to this place to give evidence, and like many other as aspects of the referendum, which I think was invigorating for our democratic uh, process, uh, that in itself is good because I think it makes this parliament a better place because of the way that we go through that democratic work, irrespective of what our political views might be. The Education and Culture Committee uh, began its inquiry, obviously, in January into the educational attainment gap, which I think all parties in this chamber agree uh, is perhaps one of the greatest uh, challenges that Scottish education uh, faces. And obviously that relates to the 2020 uh, targets across Europe and, of course, to the Scottish Government's action plan on European engagement. Its uh, findings as to how to reduce the number of early school leavers and raise the numbers entering higher education will, I think, be of particular interest. Uh, similarly, the intention of the committee to look at the experience of other European countries as to how to promote uh, the sign language, for example, in the context uh, of new legislation, I think that is also very useful evidence. The Infrastructure and Investment Committee looked at the proposed digital single market initiative that is of huge significance to Scotland and to the ICI as we continue to ensure improvements uh, to Scottish access and connectivity to digital services which are enjoyed uh, by many other EU states, perhaps to a better degree uh, than in some parts of Scotland. Certainly as a member of Mid-Scotland and Fife, I'm very well aware of the frustration felt by constituents in rural communities and I look forward to the work that will be undertaken on that basis. Uh, obviously, there have been inquiries into freight transport in Scotland, and that's got a very specific focus on transport links to mainland Europe. It's a very important area, whereby I think we ho hope to learn uh, a lot more about European models of freight infrastructure. And I know my colleague, uh, Alex Johnston, uh, has been taking a particular interest in some of these aspects. I think the Justice Committee continued to monitor the negotiations of the proposed European Public Prosecutor's Office to focus on protecting financial interests. Uh, and I think that's uh, a very important area as well because uh, I think two members have already said that the U EU uh, does face some challenges when it comes to accountability and to, to transparency. And then, of course, at a time when uh, human trafficking is uh, so very much uppermost in our minds, it seems particularly appropriate for the Justice Committee's work 2015 to include the Commission's European agenda on uh, migration. These are related issues. Uh, just to sum up, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I, I think uh, we can all pay great tribute uh, to Christina McKelvey and her committee. I think it has um, made all the committees of this Parliament sit up and take notice, not only of what that legislative implication actually is, but of the way that they go about their business and anything that improves the scrutiny in this Parliament uh, and makes it uh, more democratic uh, cannot be anything other than a good thing. Thank you. Many thanks. <clears throat> And we now move to open debate. Um, generous four-minute speeches or thereby. Willie Coffey to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. Our committee's report hopefully provides the Parliament with a useful snapshot and summary of what's happening in the European Union. As our convener 
I also said we must thank the other committees of this Parliament for examining the policies of the EU in detail in terms of their particular committee focus and how these policies might impact on Scotland. Uh, the report indicates that the EU's 2020 strategy for growth is pivotal to most of the work being undertaken and is itself almost halfway through its programme. Our Scottish MEPs, Ian Hudgston and Alan Smith, also reminded us of the value of European funding to Scotland, nearly a billion euro from the European Regional Development Fund and European Social Fund over this period to help Scotland develop our innovative low carbon economy, as well as promoting international business, tackling poverty and getting people back into work. It's important, I think, to keep highlighting the benefits of our membership of the European Union, if only as a counterbalance to the negativity coming from some. The current focus, of course, is in Mr Juncker's 10-point strategy, as mentioned by our convener, Christine McKelvey, the action plan which was published just last December. Jobs, growth and investment are key priorities, as they should be. And there are one or two others that stand out for me, particularly the work planned to develop the digital single market across Europe and plans to engage more directly with European citizens. A digital single market across Europe must surely be one of the greatest opportunities for growth, for harmonisation of technology and for competitive pricing to drive down costs for consumers. According to Mr Juncker, we can create €340 billion Euros worth of additional growth, creating hundreds of thousands of new jobs and a vibrant knowledge economy. And he went on to say, the borderless nature of technology means it no longer makes sense for each EU country to have its own rules for telecom services, copyright, data protection or the management of the radio spectrum. I certainly agree with that and the focus on some of these issues will help. But let's not kid ourselves. Companies create technology borders to make money and they make plenty from us as we move from one political jurisdiction to another. If I make the trip across from, for example, Scotland to Donegal in Ireland, the mobile phone charges are huge, but it's only 170 miles from here. If I go to Inverness, which is about 200 miles away, the charges are the same as they are at home. This is nothing to do with technology. It's about exploiting jurisdiction changes to make money from customers. That's why I was so disappointed to learn that the Commission is planning to delay for perhaps another two years, its previously stated commitment to end roaming charges in particular when people move around Europe. Roaming charges were supposed to be phased out by the end of this year. If we're serious about these noble aims and objectives to create a digital single market with things like super fast broadband right across Europe to create this market, then these issues must surely be resolved. A true digital single market should mean that we get the choice of using any digital service providers in Europe for things like mobile and broadband, not just restricted, uh, the restricted and diminishing choice we have in the UK. And it should also mean that consumers are free to choose what, for example, TV broadcast they might want to buy too. Why should consumers across Europe be restricted to their national broadcaster and in some cases forced to pay for this? when there are plenty of other service providers across Europe who, whom they might wish to watch. And I cite the RTE service from Ireland as a, a, particular, a particular one. Um, when we asked the EU Commissioner, Jackie Miner, she accepted that the Commission needs to take measures to restore trust and that plans were underway to help this in terms of in how we engage with European citizens. If you do take a look at their public-facing websites, presiding officer, they're hardly designed and written for the ordinary citizen to connect with. And Mrs Minor recognised this. I feel this is a, a crucial area of work for the EU and the Commission. Telling the public in Europe the positive story about Europe and how the nations of Europe benefit from and help one another is a great story to tell, but it needs to be told often in a much more accessible language than we have seen so far. If not, then the negative elements fuelled by anti-European press are only too happy to pick up on those issues and use them to attack the whole founding principles of the EU, promoting cooperation, jobs, economic growth and peace. President officer, I very much hope to see some further progress in both these issues that I've highlighted today and perhaps we might also get the chance to update Parliament before our session ends next May. Thank you. Thank you.
Now Colin Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Presiding officer, I welcome the opportunity to discuss the important relationship between Scotland and Europe and our shared goals uh, over the coming years. Our committees play a vital role in the scrutiny of how effective this relationship is and ensuring that we as a parliament fulfil our commitments. Scotland's policy relationship with Europe is important in terms of achieving stable growth through interconnectivity and contributing to the objectives of the Europe 2020 strategy. As Jose Manuel Barroso in the opening chapter of that strategy writes, economic realities are moving faster than political realities, as we have seen with the global impact of the financial crisis. Microphone for Mr. Chisholm, please. Also a more determined and coherent response at the political level. As members will be aware, there are so many areas of development that we can go into, and this demonstrates just how much the European objectives for 2020 interact with our own policy process. However, I will endeavour today to remain focused on one area. We as a Parliament have faced many challenges over recent months, as uncertainty over renewable investment and in our clean energy sector has impacted on the success of key firms such as Palamas in my own constituency. Therefore, I'd like to focus on research and development in the EU 2020 strategy and what we're doing here to fulfil our potential in this key sector. As the Scottish Government's National Reform Programme report highlights, quoting again, our capacity for innovation in new renewable technologies in pharmaceuticals and healthcare and in biotechnology requires the finest minds from across the European Union and the global academic community to see our shores as a destination of choice. One of the lessons learned from the Palamas closure was that innovation and collaborative working across Europe are necessary if we are to produce products that are commercially appealing. A strong R&D base on which to build is essential, and to that extent I'm glad to read in the Scottish Government's NRP that growth in this area will focus on the flagship EU initiative, Innovation Union. Research and development is important in terms of making the most of our emerging industries, and this I feel is particularly relevant to the renewable energy sector. Ensuring that the focus is on making our new technologies commercially viable is vital to ensure investment by the private sector is secure in future years. The transition to a low-carbon economy is a key component in the success of the government's economic strategy, with investment meeting the twin aims of boosting our economy and achieving carbon reduction targets. In evidence to the committee cited in the committee's report, the Scottish Government stated, uh, quoting again, the Scottish Government wants to see strong incentivisation, research and innovation to lower costs and ensure that energy efficiency, renewables, particularly offshore wave, tidal and wind, energy storage and carbon capture and storage can play their part in the EU energy mix, improving energy security and creating jobs and growth. This statement rings true, particularly when we bear in mind the debate held recently in this chamber addressing the need to incentivise innovation in wave power technologies. However, reform of the current laws dictating rules around state aid may also be necessary if we are to ensure that a loss like Palamas is avoided in future. Members will be aware that in committee evidence, the EERC asked Jacqueline Minor about the possibility of the Commission changing their approach to state aid rules so that Scottish investment in renewable energy would allow the state to invest in projects such as wave and tidal power. Uh, Ms Minor stated in my final quote, one of the five dimensions of the communication on the energy union will certainly be research and development. It will look at ways in which we can encourage more investment in research into clean and sustainable technologies. It is premature to speculate about whether it will look at the existing state aid rules, but from having accompanied the Commissioner earlier in the week, I know that he is very enthusiastic about carbon capture and storage. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, we have the workforce and the skills to make Scotland a leader within the EU if we pay heed to the lessons of Palamas and look to incentivise growth in new technologies in a more collaborative way while also looking at how current state aid rules may be reformed to ensure that where state support is urgently required, it may be given. Many thanks. Now call on Roderick Campbell to be followed by Anne McTaggart. A generous four minutes. Presiding officer, as the Justice Committee's EU rapporteur, I'm pleased to be able to speak in this debate, although I'm also a member of the European External Relations Committee, and I'd uh, like to acknowledge the considerable work that's gone into that committee's report, to the work the clerks have done, and indeed the convener in putting the report together. Before I look ahead to future work, I want to touch on one aspect of the Justice Committee's EU scrutiny, which started in 2012 and which concluded at the end of last year. 
That is the UK government's EU opt-out decision, which came into effect on the 1st of December 2014. In the run-up to this date, serious concerns were raised about how this decision would impact on Scottish interests and whether the European arrest warrant would be affected and what the implications might be if there was a gap between the block opt-out coming into effect and the opting back into individual measures. Over this time, we received updates on the various Westminster's committee's inquiries on the issue, and we requested written submissions from the Lord Advocate, Police Scotland, the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society, and held regular evidence sessions with the Scottish Government, although we didn't quite persuade a member of the UK Government to attend to meet us. But I thank all these bodies for keeping the committee updated on this significant issue, and I'm pleased that there seems to have been a smooth transition from the opt-out to individual opt-ins on the 1st of December. Of course, in my personal view, it's very important for Scotland to remain a member of the European Union. And in the event that there is a referendum on EU membership, I'm pleased that others in these islands support the First Minister's call for a double majority, uh, which has also received support also from the First Minister of Wales, at least as a concept worth uh, looking at. Our engagement with Europe should, of course, be one of cooperation and exchanging best practice. For example, Scotland has become a part of the Vanguard Initiative for New Growth by Smart Specialisation, which aims to influence the future direction of innovation and entre entrepreneurship within Europe's member states and regions. In the Justice Committee, our priorities for this year focus on five areas, which I'll set out briefly. The Scottish Government's updated action plan on European engagement, the European Union's e-justice and the Scottish Government's justice digital strategy and how they interact, criminal procedure dossiers and the European Public Prosecutor's Office proposal, and also the European Agenda on Migration, and finally the Justice and Home Affairs Agenda of the EU for the years 2015 to 20. Turning to these in turn, the Committee will look carefully at the new Scottish Government's updated action plan on European engagement and will be seeking to identify any key justice issues for scrutiny. We'll also be keeping a close eye on the Justice and Home Affairs agenda as and when those new proposals are published to ensure that Scottish interests are, of course, protected. On e-justice, in recent months, the committee has heard much about the Scottish Government's justice digital strategy, and therefore we're keen to see how that fits in with the EU e-justice programme. The Scottish Government has confirmed that there are common objectives between the two, and it's currently identifying which of the e-justice actions might help it to progress. The four main justice digital strategy projects, which are Digital Platform, Justice Portal, Justice Communications and Legal. And we expect a further update from the Scottish Government on this work in the months ahead. As to the European Public Prosecutor's Office regulation, the Committee has an ongoing interest in that proposal, having reported subsidiarity concerns on the proposal in 2013. Although the UK Government does not at this stage wish to opt into the proposal, there may still be implications for working arrangements between Scottish prosecutors and the EPPO, so we're keen to keep an eye on how this proposal has developed. We understand, however, that negotiations on the proposal may take some time, so that this is likely to be a long-standing uh, piece of work. Finally, on the European agenda on migration, the Committee is currently considering the Human Trafficking and Ex Exploitation Scotland Bill at Stage 1, and we're therefore keen to hear more about the European agenda on migration, which was listed in the Commission's work programme, and to see whether there's any interaction. But of course, in the light of recent unfortunate events to which the Minister referred earlier on, it seems that this particular aspect of the European agenda will merit much greater attention at a European level in the months ahead. And I believe that this Parliament would be wise also to keep a close eye on the European agenda on migration. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call on Anne McTigert, after which we'll move to closing speeches. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I am particularly pleased to contribute to this debate being a fairly new member of the European and External Relations Committee. And I would also like to congratulate all my colleagues from the committee, past, both past and present, on releasing the report which outlines the details of how we and other committees in the Scottish Parliament have engaged on European issues over the past year and priorities for EU engagement in the coming year. In Scotland's action plan for EU engagement that was published a few weeks ago by the Scottish Government, it is set out that Scotland firmly believes that its best interests lie in remaining as part of the European Union and maintaining its strong relationship with Europe. 
Scotland's place in the EU has led the way to prosperity, sustainability and security throughout the country for more than four decades and will only increase as our relationship grows stronger. The mutually beneficial relationship that Scotland and the European Union share is essential for both parties involved. Within this relationship, Scotland aims to deliver its own influence over key EU policies to ensure that our country's best interests are met. Through careful examination of the Europe 2020 strategy, the Scottish Government has decided which elements of the initiative should be prioritised. These are the points at which European engagement will be focused. While many of the committees throughout the Scottish Parliament have made a priority of considering EU engagement, including the scrutiny of the EU policies, it has to be noted that sadly the levels of engagement in this particular topic have declined over the last year. It is therefore essential to be reminded of the fact that maintaining the strong relationship Scotland has with the EU is essential. But we must continue to hold the European Union accountable and evaluate their policies as they fit in with our needs. The European External Relations Committee aims to lead the Scottish Government in their engagement with the European Union and will continue to sc scrutinise the Scottish Government and its engagement within the EU in order to carry out the scrutiny functions. Early engagement is key as well as prioritising the monitoring of future European legislation being drafted or being implemented just now. The European and External Relations Committee, I'm sure, will happily act as the hub for which this scrutiny and engagement will take place within the Scottish Government to guarantee that Scotland's best interests are being met in Europe. In conclusion, President Officer, I am sure my colleagues will agree with me that there is no doubt that Scotland is an essential part of the European Union and that the European Union is an essential part of Scotland. In order to maintain the best possible relationship, it is necessary that the Scottish Government continues on its efforts to best engage with and monitor the policies which the EU sets forth. This will ensure that Scotland will continue to thrive as much as possible as part of the EU. Thanks. We now move to the closing speeches and I invite Liz Smith to speak. A generous four minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think uh, Christina McKelvey uh, made an interesting introduction this afternoon when she talked about the increasing depth of the committee reports when it comes to the EU influence. Uh, she talked about the increasing influence, obviously, of the EU on Scottish affairs, and uh, she hinted at some streamlined changes that were necessary uh, to bring about greater accountability. I think that's a very valid point. And she also referred to uh, the impending uh, referendum on Europe. And politics aside, and I do stress this, I don't think it's a part time to make uh, party political comments, but I think the uh, impending referendum it is an opportunity to look again at how Europe does things and obviously Scotland uh, as uh, part of uh, that process. And I think that is important for two reasons, because those of us who do wish to see the UK very firmly uh, established as part of the EU, primarily because of the huge economic benefits that it brings, uh, there is no question that we do want to see uh, some reform. And I suspect all parties in this chamber uh, want to see reform of some uh, sort, particularly the tougher budget discipline that I think is required. I think it's unquestionable that people want to have greater transparency and uh, there is also no question about having greater accountability because, uh, I, again, I think it was Christina McKelvey who uh, introduced the issue of trust. Trust does need to be uh, rebuilt. It's very important in politics to have trust and I think uh, one of the issues facing the EU is it has lost trust. Uh, across uh, the continent for a variety of different reasons uh, and that needs uh, to be uh, addressed. 
Uh, I chair uh, the uh, cross-party group on colleges and universities, and some very interesting things happening in that field too, which uh, make it very clear about the need uh, for greater accountability and transparency as our young people and our mature students as well uh, look uh, much further afield. And I think one of the most interesting developments that's happened uh, recently uh, is the fact that uh, the UCAS system is being opened up beyond uh, the uh, current UK uh, system. And I think that's very good news because I think it means that our young people are looking abroad uh, to study and obviously uh, we are wanting to attract more people uh, to come to this country, including uh, those from the EU. And I'm very conscious of the uh, government's attempts to try and improve that process, which I think they have been let down a bit by the Westminster government uh, on that. We had a previous debate on that just a little while ago, and I fully support the Scottish government's move to try uh, to address that. So I think there's lots of interesting things going on uh, in, the, in the whole uh, aspect of how we look at the EU, um, but there is unquestionably uh, an approach that I think uh, has to restore that trust uh, in the institutions. Um, we're in, in a situation where the world is changing very fast. Somebody mentioned uh, very accurately that it is a marketplace. I think it was uh, uh, Humza Youssef who said quite rightly that it is a big marketplace. It matters a great deal to us um, as uh, a trading nation and part of uh, obviously a UK trading nation as well. That matters and we have to ensure that the processes by which we engage in that are fit for purpose, and I think there are some question marks uh, over that. So if I can just uh, draw the Scottish Conservatives' remarks to a close on this, I think the committee report has been uh, very uh, important for pointing us in the right direction of some of the challenges uh, that we do face. Uh, as I said uh, when I closed my opening remarks, uh, if there is anything that can make this Parliament a better place when it came, comes to the democratic uh, scrutiny process, then that has got to be a good thing. We've got lots of question marks about the committee system in this parliament just now that I know the presiding officer is wanting to lead uh, some discussion on that. And I think that's right and proper because I think uh, if there is anything about democracy that is the most important thing, it's about that scrutiny that allows transparency and for trust to be rebuilt in the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Claire Baker and I can give you five minutes or so. Um, thank you, President Officer. This is a brief debate this afternoon which recognises the role our committees play in engaging with Europe and examines the priorities they have identified which have particular importance for Scotland and considers the EU priorities. Um, the committees play an important role in encouraging early engagement and um, seeking to mainstream the scrutiny of EU legislation into the subject committees where they are able to identify the relevance to their areas of expertise and mainstreaming and coordinating implementation of the legislation. Um, we often bemoan the poor turnout at European elections. Only 33.5% of the electorate took part in May 2014. But across Europe, the turnout is not much better. Although higher than a third of our electorate, 2014 was still the lowest recorded turnout figure for a European election. Um, some in the chamber this afternoon have referred to a possible EU referendum. Um, as we are weeks away from a UK election, Europe and our membership of the EU is perhaps not as prominent as commentators were predicting a few months ago. Um, the agenda feels as though it has moved on to much more domestic matters and there are more exciting predictions for commentators to be speculating on than Europe. Um, despite talk of Eurosceptics, I feel that most of the electorate are fairly apathetic towards um, European politics and it is marked that EU referendum seems to have fallen off the agenda. Um, there are many reasons for the, I think, the apathy from the, from the public, but I would suggest there continues to be a lack of understanding of what Europe delivers for us in the modern world. And this is partly the responsibility of European leaders who continue to be very institutionally focused and also member state leaders who often prefer to take the or prefer to present the positive measures from Europe as their own, but take the opportunity to criticise Europe when there are challenges. Um, this is combined with a lack of confidence from the citizen that Europe is actually working for the ordinary person. We are seeing huge economic challenges across Europe. Our fellow Europeans in many countries are experiencing and continue to experience levels of poverty and economic downturn not seen for many years. Uh, many countries are seeing a crisis in youth unemployment, which leads to significant social problems and often depopulation, as those who can begin to look for opportunities elsewhere. These are significant challenges with no quick solutions. 
Um, in response to this, Europe, the Parliament, the Commission, the Council of Ministers, for too many people, does not look as if it is adequately responding. And yet, if we could see delivery on the 10 priorities that everyone has spoken about this afternoon, we would see a modern, responsive union that is able to address the pressures of our modern times. Um, expansion of the European Union has changed the funding opportunities and the landscape for Scotland. And while we remain part of CAP funding, our farmers and our farmers receive support. We can see that as an example where the focus for agriculture has started to change with a much greater focus now on land management and the environment and the Commission starting to change the way in which it spends um, its resources. Um, the funds that Scotland receives for regeneration has changed um, dramatically over the years, but there are still opportunities. Um, and some members talked about the European Social Fund um, and other areas. And the Minister knows that I've previously raised concerns around Horizon 2020 and the concerns that are um, from the university sector about changes being proposed there. Um, we do need to be alert to opportunities, however, um, and the report and some of the members this afternoon did talk about possible opportunities in regeneration. Um, or e-health, as it was looked at by the Health Committee, and also potential funding for cultural heritage, um, as the EC Committee looked at. And the committees do have an important part to play in overseeing this. Um, reflecting on some of this afternoon's speeches, um, Liz Smith highlighted the freight transport report, um, and this does demonstrate how Europe has an impact on many areas um, of our economy. Um, Christina McKelvey and Willie Coffey both talked about the digital um, single market, um, highlighting the issue of um, competitive pricing and the need for more consistency across Europe. It is an economy which is borderless and it makes no sense to have um, multiple rules. And this is a good example of how the Europe and the Commission could make changes which benefit your average European citizen. And as Willie Coffey says, these issues should be resolved much more quickly than the current timescale that is proposed. Um, Malcolm Chisholm talked um, effectively about the challenges facing the renewable sector um, and here a need for a greater concentration in research and cooperation. Um, I mean, Malcolm, highlight, Malcolm Chisholm highlighted the innovation um, proposals and the need for greater collaborative research. We are still some way um, to go in renewables for some of them to be commercially viable and there needs to be a greater focus on this. And as Malcolm Chisholm said, um, the report when the committee asked about state aid rules um, there wasn't a lot of clarity from the Commission. There were certainly warm words there and positive noises, but there wasn't a lot of clarity from the Commission about where we might see changes. Um, I was struck by the report that there were many opportunities for cooperative working and sharing of good practice. Um, Christina McKelvey raised the TTIP report that is coming from the Committee. This TTIP you know, can, can give us opportunities uh, in trade in an expanding world, but there is, I think, consensus largely across this chamber that the NHS needs to be excluded from any proposals that are coming forward. Um, Rod Campbell talked about the work of the Justice Committee, and as we anticipate a human trafficking um, and exploitation bill, it is sensible that the committee will take evidence from Europol and EU experts on human trafficking. And I support the Minister's earlier comments on people smuggling and the need to address this as a humanitarian issue. Um, the Equalities Committee is also looking to learn from EU counterparts in taking forward its work on female genital mutilation. And when we are facing a situation like that, which is evident throughout Europe, it is important we work together to find solutions. Um, in closing, President Officer Anne McTaggart referred to the debate that we had on Europe earlier this year which although it didn't result in an agreed motion, there was actually quite a lot of consensus um, and agreement in this chamber about the importance of Scotland um, and the UK, the importance of our engagement with Europe and continued membership of Europe. So in closing, I'd just like to thank the committee um, for the work that they have done and look forward to the Parliament's opportunities to explore some of these issues going forward in this coming year. Many thanks. And I now call on Hamza Youssef, Minister, seven minutes or so. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. A uh, brief debate, but one that's covered uh, a number of very important issues and uh, a range of issues and a range of topics uh, that are important to members in their own constituencies, but also uh, of great national importance for Malcolm Chisholm, quite rightly raising uh, the important issue of uh, renewables and wave and tidal technology in particular, and f uh, segueing into to research and development and innovation. Uh, Claire Baker touching upon that theme too, just at the end there about Horizon 2020, and she has been consistent uh, and, and her concerns that if any, any further budget reduction to Horizon 2020, how that might impact 
our research and development and our academic institutions. And I hope I've given uh, strong assurances and can reiterate those strong assurances that we too would share such uh, concerns. Uh, Willie Coffey talking very eloquently about digital uh, connectivity and, and, the, and, the, and the having a true single market uh, and the exploitativeness, he's right to use that word, uh, of, of some uh, multinational corporations uh, not willing to sit down uh, to be, um, you know, to, to take a sensible approach uh, to a variety of digital uh, issues. And I know that's a, a matter of great uh, concern to, to Willie Coffey. He's been consistent again over the years in uh, raising this issue in this chamber. Uh, justice issues, which I'll reflect more on from Roderick Campbell and Liz Smith, speaking on behalf of, of Jamie McGregor, of course, uh, talking about a variety of transport issues, educational issues, uh, migration and energy union, which I know is something actually that Jamie uh, McGregor himself has raised many on many occasions uh, in this chamber on this debate about uh, the EU. I'm very grateful to have had the, con the, the opportunity to contribute to this debate on behalf of, of the government. Uh, it's important that when we're talking about EU engagement priorities, uh, that they have a locus on the European Commission's own 2020 programme, which will be taken forward through the European Commission's work programme uh, of 2015. As you've heard, this is in effect a 23-point plan to take forward the growth agenda in the EU and is a subject which I wrote to the committee on myself in January, setting out where the key interest uh, areas are for the Scottish Government. The work programme, I think, is more focused than it has been in, in previous years, a sign that perhaps the Commission is serious about reconnecting uh, with the citizens. Uh, this is an issue that Claire Baker and other members have touched upon. I think that is a fundamental failing. I think the Commission would be the first to say that's a fundamental failing of the EU to, to connect and make itself relevant uh, to uh, the citizens of its member states. But also perhaps it's a demonstration of the Commission's understanding that perhaps doing less, but doing less more effectively and strategically, is a better approach to take. Uh, and although more focused, there are a number of strategic issues that will be of considerable uh, interest to a number of committees that are going forward. Climate change, uh, as has been mentioned, will loom large ahead of the major conference in Paris towards the end of the year, in which countries of the world will seek to hammer out a global climate deal. And the Scottish Government will, of course, play its role in that, and as Claire Baker said, will help us to reach uh, our own targets potentially to here in Scotland. Uh, the energy union package, which is incredibly important, I know, to Jamie McGregor, who can't be here, uh, will also be a, a critical initiative. And I welcome the Energy Committee's intention to consider the strategic framework for energy union in the context of its work on oil and gas, wave and tidal power, uh, and energy efficiency. There are many, many other elements of the Commission's work programme uh, that will have major relevance to committees going forward, but uh, clearly I am limited by time. I do want to make a point on migration, as others have done itself. A key issue in the Commission's work programme. I welcome the intention of the Justice Committee, as Rod Roderick Campbell uh, highlighted, to examine how the Commission intends to deal with issues uh, as part of its migration strategy against people trafficking and indeed smuggling. It's a major issue that needs to be addressed, and the Scottish Government, of course, has been deeply disturbed uh, about the deaths uh, of so many migrants in the Mediterranean uh, who have sought to enter the EU from Africa. Uh, there are many other elements of the Commission's work programme that will have major relevance to committees uh, going forward. I, I do um, also wish to, to, to make uh, mention uh, that I think it's very good that in this chamber we've had a very positive discussion about the benefits of the EU. Uh, I would say that there might be other parliaments uh, across this, these islands where you wouldn't have such a constructive debate uh, and real consensus about the benefits. Those benefits we know about, 500 million people uh, in terms of a single market, 20, access to 20 million uh, businesses. The EU in 2012 was uh, the world's uh, largest economy in terms of uh, world uh, GDP, more than uh, taking a higher percentage than, than the United States, than China. Uh, and also, uh, of course, the benefits that we've seen through uh, migration that I've already touched, up, touched upon uh, for our educational institutes socially and indeed culturally. So I wel welcome the commitment uh, from across this parliament to engage on EU issues constructively uh, and positively. Uh, and somebody going forward, the government is, is committed to a number of key points. It's committed to ensuring uh, that it continues to engage with the parliament as early as possible when it comes to forthcoming EU legislation. We're hoping to publish an updated uh, transposition guidance soon. Uh, we continue to ensure to make the case that uh, Scotland is best served as being a, a, a member 
of the EU. And of course, the UK continues to, to be a member of the, the EU as well. We think that the UK is stronger for being in the EU, and we believe the EU is stronger for having the UK as a member. And for that, obviously, our position is very clear that we don't support an in out referendum. We believe that if there is one to happen, then a double lock uh, should be in place. We'll continue to make the case for EU reform. Not a single member state uh, ever tells me that the EU is perfect, or that they believe that the EU is perfect. Every single one of us uh, wants to see some form uh, of reform, some, uh, some reform, but we believe that that can be done within existing treaty framework. Uh, we're also very keen that Scotland gets its share of the investment uh, package, working closely with the UK government uh, in that uh, regard. We want to support innovation and promoting inclusive growth uh, through active participation in the EU. We also want to use the heightened uh, interest in Scotland uh, since 2014 in particular uh, as a platform to deepen a number of our bilateral relationships uh, across the EU. Uh, the Scottish Government believes and firmly believes that the EU uh, is the best international framework to deliver social and economic gains for the people of Scotland and to tackle some of those difficult global challenges facing Scotland and its partners worldwide. We do not consider that there is any viable alternative to our EU membership capable of delivering the same economic and social prosperity to our people, uh, nor of enabling us to fulfil the Scottish Government's ambition for international engagement. But just as I, as I say that, if I listen closely, I can almost hear uh, Margot Macdonald's voice perhaps telling me otherwise. And I think it's important that there are a number of voices, and we recognise a number of voices uh, in Scotland who are not quite convinced of the case uh, of our continued EU membership. And so we have a job, I don't doubt, as governments and politicians across these benches to be firmer in terms of the benefits of, of the EU. And members might find the Scottish Government's booklet titled The Benefits of Scotland's Membership of the EU, uh, a very handy guide uh, in doing so. Just to finish and conclude, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, lastly and subsequently to the Smith Commission report, uh, the government, uh, Scottish Government will continue to work and engage constructively with the UK Government to press for strength and safeguards to ensure Scotland's voice is heard in the development of UK policy on EU issues that touch on devolved matters. That is a particular important, I'm sure, importance and interest uh, to members across this uh, parliament. And I would like to thank once again the committee uh, for its report and indeed all those that were involved uh, in putting the report together. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Hans Alamalik to wind up the debate on behalf of the European External Relations Committee. Eight minutes or so, please, Mr Malik. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and good afternoon to you. I am pleased to be able to close today's debate for the European External Relations Committee. I thank all members for their contributions, including Hamza Yusuf and Claire Baker, and I also want to thank the committee clerks, the other committee clerks who assisted, and all the people who gave evidence to the committee. It's greatly appreciated. We have also heard about what other committees' European priorities were in 2014 and what they plan to do for the rest of this parliamentary session. As our convener, Christine McKelvin, said, Last year was one of the, a great change in the European Union. I would like to take, talk about some of the themes that came out of the European External Relations Committee's report. I agree with uh, Malcolm Chisholm and Anne McTaggart and say that the European Union funds are very important for Scotland. For example, the Scottish MEPs told our committee about the 985 million euros for Scotland from the European Re Regional Development Fund and the European Social Fund for a, a period of 2020, up to 2020. We heard that these funds will go into a range of projects to help Scotland build a low carbon economy as well as promote international business opportunities, tackling poverty and getting people back to work, and mention the importance of reinforce common agricultural policy and the common fishery policies, which is also closely scrutinized by the Rural Affairs, Climate Change, and Environmental Committee. That committee is working on an area, this area, includes hearing from the, the European Commission officials on the topic. The Local Government and Regeneration Committee has also been considering European Union funds in some detail in relation to its continuing interest in develop, in develop, develop for a regional, regionalis, 
regional economy in Scotland in 2015, it will look at the options uh, from the European Structure Fund program for Scotland as well in some detail. The European External Relations Committee notes in our report that the Scottish Government has identified youth employment as a key objective for its strategy fund in Scotland. The committee is taking a special interest in the rollout of the European Union's Youth Employment Initiative. The Education and Cultural Committee has also been scrutinizing the Scottish Government's actions on youth employment in, 2000, in 2014. In considering the Education Committee's Youth Guarantee Scheme as part of its inquiry, Scotland's education and cultural future will follow this work in 2015. I also mentioned the importance of the digital agenda. The infrastructure of Capital Investment Committee has told us about their continuing interest and the committee will be taking evidence directly from the European Commission. They, look, they took evidence on how Scotland is performing on the digital agenda and that more can be done to encourage digital participation. Willie Coffey and Roddy Campbell have mentioned this area in a digital arena as well as the justice uh, challenges that face Scotland. Our Justice Committee told us that they intend to monitor the European Union's work on e-justice in the background of the Scottish Government's digital strategy in Scotland. The Justice Committee also intends to pursue a very of very the important issues such as the Commission's European agenda on migration, people trafficking, Scotland Bill. This is an area in which the European and External Relations Committee has a special interest. The Rural Affairs Committee challenge and the Environment Committee continue to work in this area. Tac tracking development relation, related to the European Union. The 2020 climate targets and target and also the establishment of the European Union 2030 framework for climate and environment policies. I know that they will follow very closely the negotiations leading up to the, European, the United Nations framework convention on climate change meeting in Paris in November. The Equal Opportunities Commission hopes to be mainstreaming European Union issues on several work areas, such as its inquiry into the experience for social isolation faced by people in Scotland and also in an upcoming race and ethnicity related inquiry, which is very important as many in the minority community feel let down in Scotland. I hope that one have, the others have found our report interesting. I look forward to another year of effective scrutiny and mainstreaming the European Union's issues of importance across all subjects, committees for the citizens of Scotland. And please wish us well in the success of that future. May I also take this opportunity, presiding officer, to say that uh, I note that Jamie McGregor is unwell uh, and I, I wish him a very speedy uh, recovery. Uh, he is being missed daily here. And I know that he was particularly interested in uh, the uh, common agricultural policy as well as the common fishery policy. And I don't want him to feel that his absence has not been noted and the fact that he was interested in this area. And I want to stress that the digital network is crucial for the Scottish economy and its growth. And I think it's absolutely crucial that that our local um, and uh, our, it is also important that our MEPs take this fight to the European Union to ensure that we get uh, all the support that we can in rolling out this program. I think it's absolutely important for us. Presiding officer, how much time do I have? I can give you another minute or so. Well, that's very kind. Thank you very much. Uh, presiding officer, just in, in concluding, I, I want to take this opportunity uh, to thank our chair in particular, Christy McElvin has been, um, been working tirelessly with us in trying to ensure that we deliver an effective program last year, and I'm, I'm looking forward to doing so this year as well. And I may also take this opportunity to say that I, 
I want to thank particularly all those people who took out their very, very valuable time to come to our Scottish Parliament and give us evidence, because I think it was important that we share their experiences, uh, which would help us put our report together. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. That then concludes the European and External Relations Committee's debate on EU engagement and scrutiny of the committees of the Scottish Parliament and European Union policies. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. And the next item of business is a debate on motion number 12951 in the name of Stuart Stevenson on the proposal for a member's interest bill. Could I ask members who would like to contribute to this debate to please press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Stuart Stevenson to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Mr Stevenson, around 10 minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The role of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee is to keep the Parliament's procedures and processes under constant review. The Scotland Act 2012 gave the Parliament some extra flexibility to manage our members' interest regime, and the Committee has used this opportunity to take a fresh look at how we operate our standards. The Committee is now presenting the Parliament with a proposal for a Committee Bill under Rule 9.15 of Standing Orders, which has two aims to make the register of interest more transparent and to make the standards regime even more robust. I'll first address uh, proposals for increased transparency. Under the 2006 Interest Act, members have to register certain financial interests. These are then published in the Parliament's Register of Interests. The Register is principally concerned with interests which might prejudice or which might appear to prejudice a member's ability to participate in the parliamentary proceedings in a disinterested way. The public deserve to know about a member's financial interests so that they can make a judgment on whether the member might be influenced by them. Separately, members also have to register donations or loans for political activities with the Electoral Commission. The Commission has its own rules and thresholds for what needs to be registered, which are different from the Parliament's rules, and it publishes its own register. This is known as dual reporting. It means that the public have to look in two places for information about a member's interests, and that members have to register financial interests in two separate places under two separate sets of rules. The draft bill we bring forward aims to end dual reporting. Members would only have to register financial interests in one place, and more importantly, the public would only have to look in one place to find out information about a member's financial interests. Under our proposals, the Parliament's existing registration requirements will continue to apply. We've been careful to leave the existing regime as undisturbed as possible. But there will be an additional layer of reporting requirements imported from the Political Parties Elections and Referendum Act, PEPERA as it's known, <laughs> the legislation that governs the Electoral Commission's regime. PEPERA is... Uh, quite a complicated set of rules, but in summary, members must register donations or loans over £1,500 which have been received for political activities. That might be a single donation or it might be several donations of more than £500 from the same person in the same calendar year. As the name of the Act suggests, PEPERA is concerned with members of political parties. But of course, we also have members here who are independent members. And we're proposing some specific changes to deal with the position of independent members. The Deputy Convener will speak about these in more detail in her closing remarks and other matters that I won't have time to deal with now. The proposals that we have in the bill have been discussed in depth with the Electoral Commission. They have to be satisfied that the Parliament's register will give them all the information that they need before they can agree to the ending of dual reporting. The Commission have told us that our proposals, along with changes we shall propose in due course to the Code of Conduct, should meet their requirements. Now, as PEPERA is reserved legislation, the UK Parliament then has to pass a commencement order to exempt members from the PEPERA reporting requirements. 
And let me just put on record my appreciation of the Commission's help in getting the bill to its current stage. Between last year's referendum and this year's general election, the Commission are clearly busy, but they've always been very helpful in helping us navigate our way through their quite complex regime. It's an important reform that we're now proposing that will keep our Parliament here in step with the Parliament for the UK. Dual reporting has already ended for, for Westminster MPs, and we understand that the other devolved institutions are also considering changes. The draft bill builds the requirements of APERA into the Parliament's interest act. Uh, I'm the first to admit that the bill we're bringing forward will look complex in terms of drafting. But if we look at how we can boil the changes down, there are a number of key questions that members must ask themselves. Has anyone given me a gift or donation of money, goods or services? Has anyone funded an overseas visit for me? Have I been paid for any work I've done outside? Do I own shares or property apart from my own home? In most of these cases, in all of these cases, there could be a registrable interest. And as convener of the Standards Committee, and not simply in an effort to reduce the workload on our committee, my advice is very simple. Always ask the Standards clerks for advice if you think there is any possibility that you may have acquired a new interest or if the nature of an interest you already hold may have changed. For example, where the value of shares rises above the threshold without the individual member having taken any particular action. The clerks can help navigate the complexities of the existing legislation and the new provisions. The bottom line is members must approach them within 30 days of acquiring a new interest and must look at uh, the value of their shares on an annual basis. The committee will also bring forward um, changes to the members' code of conduct, uh, which uh, relate to what I'm saying. At the start of each new session, in particular the next one, the standards clerks and officials from the Electoral Commission will arrange briefing sessions for members on what we expect the new rules to be. I believe that our proposals will mean a more streamlined system for members. They will only have to seek advice in one place, from our standards clerk here in Parliament. They will only have to register interests in one place, here in Parliament, and the public will be able to find all a member's interests in one place, the parliamentary register. By increasing transparency, these proposals chime with other developments on the horizon, not least the proposal for a lobbying register, which we expect the government to bring forward soon. One more benefit of ending dual reporting is that complaints about failing to register will all be dealt with by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland. At the moment, a complaint could be investigated by the Commissioner or by the Electoral Commission or even by both at the same time. This can be confusing for the public to navigate and could also result in a member having to deal with two separate investigations into essentially the same complaint. Committee's proposals would streamline the process so that all complaints are dealt with by the Commissioner. So, to sum up our proposals for the ending of dual reporting, information about a member's financial interest will be available in one place for the public, Members will have a one-stop shop for advice or on registering interests and will streamline the process for dealing uh, with complaints. In addition, we propose in the light of the Greco report uh, to lower the threshold for registering gifts from 1% of a member's salary at the start of a session to half a percent. Uh, this will bring us into line with legislators elsewhere and respond to the report uh, from the Council of Europe's uh, group. I said that our second aim in this bill is to make the Parliament's standards regime more robust. We have already got a very robust regime. In the whole session, we've only had to deal with one relatively minor breach of the Interest Act by a member. But it is a criminal offence when a member fails to register, declare an interest, or undertakes paid advocacy. That's not the case in the House of Commons. Uh, we should be proud of our existing regime, but we're not resting on our laurels, and we believe as a committee we can go further. 
Firstly, the Bill extends the sanctions available to Parliament if for dealing with breaches of the Interest Act. The power to withdraw rights and privileges is already available. However, when it comes to Interest Act breaches, the Scotland Act requires us to set out specific sanctions in legislation. The draft bill makes sure that the widest range of sanctions is available for breaches of the Interest Act, including excluding a member from the premises of the Parliament, withdrawing a member's right to use the facilities and services provided by the SPCB, withdrawing salary and allowances where a member is excluded. To that end, the committee has also included a new sanction in the draft bill, a motion of censure. This would allow the Parliament to draw attention to a breach and a debate in the Chamber and give the member the opportunity to comment and apologise as may be appropriate. Members will appreciate that this is not a trivial sanction. For some breaches, it may be more appropriate than withdrawing pay or access. In conclusion, the committee's proposal will increase the transparency of information about our financial interests, make the standards regime that we have even more robust. I commend the committee's proposal to Parliament and I move the motion that is in my name. Many thanks. And I now call on Joe Fitzpatrick, Minister, seven minutes or so, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to start by quickly reflecting on the background to the committee's work on updating the members' interest statute. The committee should be commended for moving quickly to utilise the powers arising from the implementation of the Scotland Act 2012, which gave this Parliament the ability to review the terms of the members' interest framework in full. Um, we now anticipate the Parliament will soon be responsible for all matters relevant to its internal operations. And I think that's something that, that we've certainly argued for since the first session of the Parliament and this Government has advocated since coming to office. And it's, I think it's good that, that there is, I think, generally consensus um, across the Parliament. This is an area um, where this Parliament should have uh, responsibility for. That default position, the normal position for parliaments around the world, is only right, and I therefore welcome today's opportunity to consider the substance of the proposals contained in the committee's report. <clears throat> the subject matter of this debate is clearly a matter for parliament. I do, however, wish to take this opportunity to put the government's views on the record, and I hope this will be helpful to both the committee and the parliament as a whole. Um, I consider the reform package proposed by the committee represents a significant and progressive step forward and, and I think it's, it's good to, to re-emphasise the, the words of the convener um, about this is about more trans making the, the, the regime more transparent and more robust. We already have transparent and, and robust um, procedures in place but it's always appropriate for us to look at how they can be improved and, and I think that's absolutely correct that that's what's being done. So I'm very pleased to confirm that the government is supportive of the committee's proposals and considers it appropriate that the, a bill is brought forward to implement them, um, one of, I think, the first committee bills in, in some time. Members of the committee will recall that during the consultation pro process, the government identified two issues which it believed required careful consideration. The first issue was the question about whether criminal offences for failure to register or declare an interest should be removed. And the second was the question about whether a rectification process should be introduced to separately deal with minor instances um, of non-compliance and avoid investigations of such cases by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life. Government's response to the consultation put forward some arguments around the merits of implementing such policies. In particular, we were concerned that either move could be perceived as diluting the accountability of, of MSPs um, and I think we therefore welcome the committee's decision not to proceed with those, those measures after obviously careful consideration of the, of the consultation. I think that's something that we very much welcome. Um, moving on to the proposals the committee seeks to implement, um, I'd in particular welcome the end to dual reporting of members' financial interests to both the Parliament and the Electoral Commission. The benefits of this reform are twofold. Firstly, it will streamline the registration process for MSPs, ending a confusion and potentially disruptive arrangement. And secondly, it will provide a single point of reference for the public. And of course, importantly, together with a single complaint system for any perceived instances of non-compliance. 
So both, both those two things, I think, are, are, are very important. It would be wrong to underestimate, however, the challenges that face the committee in seeking to combine um, what were two um, different registration schemes. And I think to, to, to do so without undermining the robustness of either scheme and also without adding any unnecessary complexity is, I think, a significant achieve achievement which I hope um, is recognised across the Parliament as a, as, a, as a whole. The proposals also seek to deliver parity amongst MSPs, uh, reflected of the Parliament's founding principles, so looking to ensure that dual reporting can end also for independent members, despite existing statutory mechanisms being based on members of political parties, and on the other uh, side of that coin, requiring independent members to be made subject to the requirement to register controlled transactions, as those of us are in political parties are, such as um, a credit facility extended to an MSP for political activities. And the government... Indeed. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, it may just be useful to colleagues uh, to be aware that I have uh, discussed with each of our present uh, independent members the proposals. Uh, I note none of them are clearly going to be speaking in the debate, so it may well... Uh, I, I don't seek to speak for them, but at no time did they indicate that this was other than satisfactory to them. Minister. Indeed, I'm, 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 I'm sure that would be their view, because um, what, what you have done is managed to um, make sure that that founding principle of all MSBs being treated um, equally has, has managed to be uh, fully reflected in the, in the new guidance. And, and you know, I think that has been very much indicative of the committee's approach that, you, 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 as convener, you did have those discussions. And I think clearly um, the committee also must have worked very closely with the Electoral Commission in pulling these plans forward um, and, and in, in their development. And that is also to be welcomed because um, we need to make sure that we have proposals which are robust and, and, and actually work in the real world um, as well as um, sounding good here in the chamber. And I think you have, without doubt, managed to, to achieve, achieve that in, in your, your deliberations. The government also welcomes the committee's other um, reform proposals namely the reduction of the financial threshold for registering gifts, bringing that to a level which I think we feel, and obviously the committee feels, is, is, is more appropriate. Given the Parliament's full flexibility over imposing the imposition of sanctions in respect of any breaches of the framework, together with the ability to agree a motion of censure. And uh, lastly, we also agree with the proposal to extend the period of retention of old register entries from five to ten years. These are all sensible uh, proposals which the government agrees with. Presenting officer, the government recognises the amount of work um, invested by the committee in developing proposals in its report. That work is essential towards ensuring the members' interest framework remains fit for purpose now and for the future. Um, this will be increasingly important as the, the competence of this parliament evolves. The government will maintain its opposition to any moves to remove criminal offences from the 2006 Act or indeed any provisions which suggest that minor indiscretions are acceptable under the framework. And I'm pleased that they, they don't exist and, and I hope no one um, tries to reintroduce them at an amendment stage. In conclusion, I want to reiterate that the government welcomes the committee's report, recognises the efforts involved and looks forward to a bill being introduced which implements its recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And I now call on Patricia Ferguson. I can give you up to six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a new member of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, who was appointed to that committee after it had heard evidence on this proposed bill, I would firstly like to thank the members of the committee and the clerks for their support as I got up to speed with the issues. And I suspect that in the time allotted to me, I will not be able to cover all the salient points of this report and its recommendations, but I would at the outset want to confirm that Scottish Labour supports the committee's recommendations and in one area at least would like to go further. Colleagues might be forgiven for thinking that issues such as the Members' Interest Order are perhaps not amongst the most important matters that this Parliament might discuss, but actually it is the legislation, the rules and the standing orders on subjects like this that help to ensure that this Parliament lives up to its founding principle of transparency. So we must be very careful when we consider change and be confident that any change we do propose makes the system better. 
And it seems to me, presiding officer, that the committee's proposals are sensible and perhaps as important, workable, and I commend them for that. The measures proposed today will help to streamline and clarify exactly what interests members have. It will also make it possible for advice to members to come from one source, the parliamentary clerks, rather than from two as at present. And as we've heard from the convener, the report prepared by the committee suggests some changes to our current procedures. And one of the most significant of those changes being proposed is that we end dual reporting of financial interests. As we've heard, at the moment, MSPs are required to report financial interests to the Electoral Commission as a condition of the Political Parties Elections and Referendum Act, or PEPERA. And they, must, and they may also be required to report to Parliament. And as a result, the information recorded can appear on the Electoral Commission's website, the Parliament's website, or in certain situations, on both. The Committee's proposals end that dual reporting and suggest that all such information should appear on the Parliament's website. Similarly, the present rules mean that advice to members can come from two different bodies, depending upon the issue, and that anyone seeking to check what a member's interests are also needs to check both sources. As a consequence, ending dual reporting will also end dual checking, which must be a good thing. At the moment, breaches of PEPERA are investigated by the Electoral Commission, but sometimes breaches overlap the two currently separate regimes, and as such are investigated by both the Electoral Commission and the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life. And the committee sensibly suggests that they should in future be investigated by the Commissioner alone. This is both a simpler way of working and much more transparent. And there was, however, one complication to these sensible changes, and that was that without also making changes to the Electoral Administration Act of 2006, dual reporting would not be ended for independent members. And it seemed to me, and the committee was of the same view, that all members of this parliament must be treated in the same way. And so the committee will, as we've heard, seek to make those necessary alterations in due course. With regard to the thresholds which apply to the register of interest, the committee, as we've heard, proposes that the threshold for registering a gift be reduced from the current figure of £570 to £280, or 0.5% of a member's salary. And this brings it into line with a recommendation by the organisation, the Group of States Against Corruption, or Greco, as it's known. It is worth noting that Greco specifically mentioned in its report that it believed that the limits in the Scottish Parliament and those used by the House of Commons and the House of Lords are too high. So we are not alone in proposing to reduce our threshold in line with the Greco recommendations as both houses at Westminster propose to do so also. The threshold the committee is also proposing to amend is for registering remuneration and it's suggested that that should go to the same percentage as should that for gifts. And we support that. But we also think that there might need to be more discussion about the threshold for shareholdings, which does seem to be at a fairly significant figure at the moment. As Parliament knows, members are required to register remuneration and related undertakings, gifts, overseas visits, interest from shares and heritable property. I think the time has come when we have to ask ourselves if this is sufficient. We know that there is no financial threshold for registering a remunerated role and that if the criteria are met and the remuneration is of any value, then the role must be registered. And we also know that the Code of Conduct prohibits forms of paid employment that involve lobbying. But is that enough? Should we not now be stating clearly that paid directorships or consultancies should be banned? Would that not be a significant move to ensure that all our constituents understand just how seriously we take our positions and their concerns? As committee members know, my party leader, Jim Murphy, had written to the presiding officer asking that the Standards Committee be asked to look at how we could implement such a ban on members seeking employment as paid directors or consultants whilst sitting as MSPs. I sincerely believe that in taking forward this issue and the work the committee is doing on lobbying, that we should look for an opportunity to consider Mr Murphy's proposal. 
certainly happy well, to. Well, very briefly, Mr Stevenson, I'm afraid the member's coming to That's a close. That's fine. No, please, but I do have to, to remind the member. Oh, right. Um, uh, speaking personally, not as convener, of course, um, I, I take a different view, not because I don't think there is more can be done, but th that we should focus on what people do, not what they are. And I think we only have to look at the lobbying legislation at Westminster, which is legislated on people's roles rather than what they do, to see the muddle you get into. So I think there is room for further debate, but perhaps not along the lines the member speaks to. Patricia Ferguson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm not sure in the time allotted to me I can fully answer Mr Stevenson's concerns. I was actually uh, going to go on to say that I was really pleased that following our discussion at committee that everyone on the committee had now agreed that we should do exactly that. Now, I am not uh, of a mind to say that we have to be prescriptive at this point, but I think that Mr Murphy makes a very, very valid point and that whatever we do, must be open and transparent to the people we serve. And that, at the end of the day, must be our overriding concern. It must be the overriding concern of every single one of us. And how we express that must be in a way that is straightforward and clear to those people that we seek to represent. I don't think they understand the niceties that we sometimes debate in this chamber. But I think that that is a debate that we can worthwhile would be worthwhile to have within the committee and within these chamber, this chamber, and I very much look forward to having that very soon. Many thanks. I now call on Cameron Buchanan. Five minutes or so, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There is so much to learn when a new member comes into the Parliament, and I have to say I found the rules and regulations of the SPPA committee quite daunting, even with the undoubted expertise of our convener and his prehistorical memory of past procedures. This dual reporting we have to undergo, where we have to register with the Parliament and the Electoral Commission, seems to me unnecessary, as everybody has said. And our proposals are that members only need to register their interests in one place, which is here in the Scottish Parliament. This would prove to be a great help to members, particularly new members like myself, as we can then approach the standards clerk for advice at no matter what the level of interest. The consultation with the Electoral Commission has been extremely complex and there's been a lot of work for the committee to bring these rules into our Parliament's regime and make it more accessible. I think it would be helpful if the Electoral Commission could give a briefing to newer members at the start of the next parliamentary session, together with the standards clerks, so we can all understand the new rules from the outset, as they are very complicated. The second point I want to make is that when the Standards Commissioner receives a complaint about an MSP failing to register an interest and it is made aware that a criminal offence has been committed, however small, it must be reported to the Procurator Fiscal. Investigations then get held up until the Procurator Fiscal has ended his or her investigation, either by a prosecution or by deciding not to prosecute. So far as I understand it, there have been no prosecutions, so I feel that the Parliament can introduce a certain element of flexibility in relation to this criminal offence, particularly when the matter is small. No criminal proceedings have ever been initiated since the Parliament's inception in 1999. I presume it has not been in the public interest to do so. Section 39 of the Scotland Act, 1998, requires a provision to be made at the Scottish Parliament's Members' Interest Act proscribing certain conduct which includes failure to register or declare certain interests and paid advocacy. But it does make co contravention of these, of these provisions a criminal offence. However, in the Scotland Act 2012, Section 39 was amended to give the Scottish Parliament more flexibility in relation to the imposition of sanctions and criminal offence attached to the failure to register or declare an interest with options ranging from removing the criminal offence to providing for a reasonable excuse for more minor breaches. I therefore feel that Parliament could introduce an element of flexibility in relation to the criminal offence. This should in no way be interpreted as being lenient or weakening the punitive aspects of members' interests. Another way would be not to make it a criminal offence, not to make a criminal offence mandatory, but left at the discretion of the Commissioner as he sees fit. I think there are also other ways of strengthening the Parliament's powers to deal with breaches of such as a motion of censure or withdrawing his or her, her rights and privilege again, privilege again without, without it necessarily becoming a criminal offence. It would also mean that breaches or complaints could be dealt with more speedily and, if necessary, be resolved in shorter timescale. There could still be a need for a prosecution if there is a serious breach of the rules, and these would then be reported to the Procurator Fiscal. But I think it's all about deciding and not defining what constitutes a serious breach of parliamentary rules. 
The committee has taken the view that taken the views of others into account and agreed not to change the criminal offence at this time. But I think it is something which I believe should be considered again, the reasons which I have outlined today. Thank you. Many thanks. I am um, now open up the debate and I have two members who wish to contribute. And I call Gil Patterson to be followed by John Pentland. Around five minutes, please. Presiding officer, before I start, I wonder if uh, you can indulge me, and uh, since this is my first opportunity mm -hmm. to speak, uh, I would like to put on record my, a personal message uh, of sympathy to my good friend, uh, his family, Tom McCabe. Uh, he was a good friend and a good colleague, so I, I wanted to say that today. Um, presiding officer, I, I want to talk about uh, something very similar to what uh, Cameron had uh, just mentioned uh, earlier on, and it's with regards to the automatic referral to the procurator fiscal. Uh, and at the very present time, uh, what happens uh, uh, now is that if a complaint uh, comes in with regards to the member's interests, then the standards commissioner uh, investigates. Uh, he conducts a very in-depth uh, investigation and if a breach is found, uh, it's an automatic referral to the procurator uh, fiscal. Now, I'm raising this I, I, in committee since the first parliament. I've raised this issue and talked about it. This is the first time I've actually brought it uh, to the chamber. And I'm conscious that no matter how trivial the matter is, there is no discretion at the hands of the Commissioner. And as it has been pointed out since the start of the Parliament in 1999, there has been almost no comment to the matters that have been referred to the fiscal in the first place. Uh, so in a political sense, there is a problem for members. And it works out that some people think that when someone is referred to the fiscal, then there's no smoke without fire. And I think it's something that we should uh, uh, look at. Now, just a few weeks ago, such a, a minor breach uh, was brought and dealt to, uh, with by the committee. And of course, uh, this minor breach uh, was indeed uh, investigated thoroughly by the, the commissioner. Uh, then, because it was actually a breach, it was agreed it was a breach, it was passed to the fiscal's office. Uh, there was no action taken. Uh, so yet again, you know, the, in my view, I, I think that the fiscal's time was wasted in many regards. And since we have a commissioner who completely investigates all these matters, it's not that he takes it as a trivial matter, uh, because effectively, the, the, if a breach is, is, is uh, if, if he investigates and a breach is made, then he's got to, to move on. But I, I think it would be much better, uh, since we have the commissioner doing uh, all that good work, that the commissioner uh, should be given the powers of discretion to deal with uh, minor breaches exactly as they are now. Uh, but report direct uh, to the Standards Committee for any sanctions. Again, that's exactly what happens uh, at the, the present time. I, I'm, I'm confident that the Commissioner has the expertise and the experience uh, in this regard. Uh, the Committee, yet again, is uh, fully supportive of the strongest possible system of standards. And I think my colleagues have, have uh, adequately I described uh, that today, that they, they, they in no way are reducing uh, the, the, uh, true, uh, uh, the aspect of uh, accountability and transparency uh, in, 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 with regards to the public. And I, I'm certainly supportive of every, everything that's been said and the report in itself. And I certainly don't want to weaken uh, in any way the, the robust standards regime that we, we have. I, I think it's, it's, it, it speaks for itself. But I do believe it, 
it's worth considering uh, and that we should ask the best people uh, to look at this. The best people for me is the Commissioner uh, and the Procurator Fiscal for their considered opinion uh, on the matter. Uh, now, it could be uh, the way we do it at this present time. There may be good reasons that this is the only way. I, I, I don't know. Uh, there may be a legal or a, a, an administrative imperative that we would damage the system that we got, we've got uh, if we did in any way change it. I must ask you to come to a close, please. Certainly. Um, so, uh, you know, so I, if that was the case, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't support that. But I would certainly uh, be grateful for the benefit of their, in, their knowledge on this and ask them to, to look at that in, in behalf of this parliament. Thank you. Many thanks. John Pentland, maximum five minutes, please. President officer, I note that lowering the threshold for registering gifts has been undertaken to comply with the recommendation of the Group of States Against Corruption in Greco, the monitoring body which includes all Council of Europe members as well as the United States and Belarus. Now, not only did Greco state that it thought the threshold for MSPs, along with those of the Commons and Lords, was rather high, they also noted that this state of affairs is particularly worrying because there are no restrictions on the acceptance of gifts without regard to whether they are required to be registered. Now, I believe that this Parliament, as an institution, has always striven to operate with the highest standards of propriety. So it's right and proper that we should take this recommendation on board and that the threshold be reduced to 0.5%. I must admit, though, that the Greco report seems to have missed the advice that MSPs are already given by accepting gifts. I think we already have a fairly explicit, and especially you know, when it comes to commercial lobbyists, could be summarised as, if you're in any doubt, don't. Now, when it comes to the proposal to streamline the reporting requirements, it is clearly a common sense approach to rationalise from two systems to one. Why have two reports for MSPs to make two places for the public to search, two places for people to complain, and overlaps because of Joe reporting, when we, can make it, when we can make life easier for all concerned, one report, one search, and one place to go for those who believe that requirements have not been met. Now, while most breaches of reporting since 1999 have been relatively minor and generally oversights, with the Parliament able to deal with them under the sanctions they possess, I do believe it, it is important to retain the option of prosecution to deal with any serious offence. And I think to do otherwise would be to undermine the importance that we attached as a parliament to the openness and transparency in the actions of elected members. And I believe that this is particularly important with regards to anyone who undertakes paid advoc advocacy work. On the question of the retention of records, Ten years to me is not unreasonable, and I can think of no other good reason why records of the previous two sessions of Parliament should not be publicly available. President officer, I suppose in conclusion, while the committee you know, has taken on board most of the Greco recommendations, the exception you know, where we might consider going further is the issue of shareholdings. Greco considers that a member may be more influenced by the effect of a matter on his or her stocks than by the receipt of the payment for a speech. And I note that the committee decided that the level was right on balance. In the report, this decision seems to be based on the levels for the Lords and the Commons being higher and the Northern Ireland Assembly being only a few grand lower. But I'm not sure whether there were any other arguments against it being lower. So what I do know is that Few, if any, of my constituents would regard having £28,000 worth of shares in a company being an insignificant financial interest. Now, while that is below our threshold, there could be several such holdings without any needing uh, to be registered. So perhaps in conclusion, uh, President Officer, uh, this could be addressed when the committee sums up. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now turn to closing speeches and I call on Cameron Buchanan. Four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
At the risk of um, repeating everything that's said, I was going to say I think that there's not really worth saying much more except in the words of Nicholas Parsons, we, shouldn't, we should be no repetition, no duplication, and no hesitation. I don't think there's anything else to say. We all agree, and I don't think we should say any more. Thank you. Which gives me a little bit of time in hand for the rest of the closing speakers, if they wish to use it. And I call on Neil Bibby around five minutes or so. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, can I also take the opportunity to thank members of the uh, Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee for the work they have done in producing uh, a draft bill and the work they are committed to doing to make uh, the register of interest more transparent and the standards uh, regime more robust. Can I also thank uh, Gil Patterson for his comments about um, Tom McCabe. Tom McCabe was instrumental in ensuring uh, the rules of the Parliament have served as well uh, over so many uh, years. As my colleagues uh, Patricia Ferguson and John Pentland have indicated, these, the aims of uh, more transparency and um, uh, the highest possible standards are supported fully uh, by uh, the Labour Party. People deserve and need to have faith and trust in those who are elected to serve them. Uh, we therefore need a system of members' interest that is fully transparent and one uh, that expects the highest standards of its members. As I've said, uh, Labour is fully committed to transparency and openness, and that's why, for example, uh, one of my Labour colleagues, Neil Finlay, uh, originally proposed a, a lobbying bill um, in this Parliament, as there needs to be proper scrutiny of, of lobbying as well as members' interests, which applies uh, both to members and government ministers following. Mr Finlay's proposals. I know the, the government have since said they would legislate in this area and I hope we can see some uh, movement on uh, this issue in the near future. In producing uh, the draft bill, I welcome the fact that the committee has engaged in lengthy discussions with the Independent Electoral Commission and I hope and anticipate uh, this will continue. Simplifying the reporting process appears to be sensible as members have um, spoken about not having dual reporting will hopefully allow increased transparency as members will have a uh, register of interest in one single place. Um, as Stuart Stevenson said and other members have said, these measures should be helpful for both members and crucially those people um, that are scrutinising us. I'm also supportive of lowering the threshold for the registering of gifts. I understand this has been recommended, as members said, by the Greco Group, and I note there are proposals in the House of Commons to also lower the existing threshold. Take a, take a yes, certainly. Yep. Stuart Stevenson. Um, the, the, the member will have noted, as I have, uh, a few references to paid advocacy, and I, I wonder if it would be useful for us all to think about what paid means, uh, in that it isn't simply cash. It's about reward or the future prospect of reward. In other words, that there's a benefit to be derived. And I think probably one of the things that we might, as we take the bill forward, do, and I hope the member will agree, uh, is examine very carefully what we mean when we talk about pay. Frankly, so our colleagues don't get confused and inadvertently transgress the rules, but also to make sure that the public are uh, absolutely aware where we're coming from when we say this, because I'm sure there's a huge measure of agreement between uh, ourselves on that. Neil Bill. Yes, and I hope that, you know, participate the committee will, will look at these issues. And, uh, but, but as obviously my colleague Patricia Ferguson said, you know, the public sometimes don't appreciate the niceties and the, and, 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 and the nuances. And in supporting, you know, the recommendations, as Patricia Ferguson said earlier, we also need to look to see if we can do more and look at um, uh, the issue around uh, shareholdings is, is, is certainly warming them. And as Patricia Ferguson said, members will be aware in February, uh, Jim Murphy spoke out about the issue of um, second jobs for MSPs and MPs. And he did, of course, write to the presiding officer to ask uh, the committee to consider introducing a ban on members seeking employment as paid directors or consultants while sitting 
as MSPs, and I don't believe the public will accept an action on this issue, and therefore we need to consider how best and how quickly this can be achieved. Our first and last role is to represent the people that elect us, uh, not outside consultants or com companies, and we cannot afford to give any other impression. It's yes, Mr. Um, Simpson. Um, if we accept the principle that there should not be outside jobs, why only directorships uh, and paid uh, and, and consultancies? Why not everything? Because it's, it's, it, it just seems rather odd to choose two particular professions out of the wide range of professions that might uh, be available to us. Neil Bevy? Well, there are two um, roles that certainly could have an impact on um, the perception in the public of um, you know, conflict of interest. And I certainly think that the committee should start looking at this issue. And those are um, two examples of where the committee should um, look to introduce a ban uh, on. I also believe it's important that any measures aimed at introducing tr uh, improving transparency should be applied fully to government ministers as well as members. The UK government publishes online its uh, ministers' registers of interest, but the Scottish Government, I do not believe, does the same. I asked Spice last June to check this out, and they replied that they had contacted the Office of the Permanent Secretary, who confirmed that the Scottish Government does maintain a register, but it is not published. Um, President Officer, all members of this Parliament have their register of interest published online. The UK Government have their uh, Minister's registers of interest published. So I, I find it inexplicable that the Scottish Government Ministers in their capacity as Ministers do not, not only have they failed to publish it, they have even uh, rejected a Freedom of Information request in 2010 from the Sunday Herald. I find this very odd uh, and I would like to ask the Minister for his uh, view on this. Um, Presiding Officer, um, in closing, um, can I uh, thank again the, the committee members um, for their work uh, so far in, in, in looking at these important issues. As I said before, Labour will support efforts to improve transparency and have the highest possible standards in relation to members' interests. Uh, but we will also look to see if what we are proposing goes far enough and the areas in which uh, we could be doing more. And I look forward to uh, the committee looking at those issues and supporting them in their deliberations. Many Thank thanks. And now call on Joe Fitzpatrick. Minister, I can give you seven minutes or so. OK. Um, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I think it's actually been a, a very good and um, consensual debate, um, and I think it reflects the approach that the committee has taken um, to, to moving forward. And I think generally... Um, there has been general support for what the committee is proposing in terms of the members' interest framework. And I, I would repeat again that the government sees these as sensible, uh, clear, and a relevant approach has been adopted, which I don't think will just me benefit members here in the parliament, but will also benefit members of the public um, in, in being able to understand the process better. Um, let me pick up on, on, on some of the points. Um, first of all, um, John Pentland, I think, made some, some really good and clear points in relation to the, the gifts and, and the benefit of doing away with dual reporting, and I think that's, uh, that's important. Um, sorry, and, and I should have started by um, concurring with the, the, the comments of um, uh, Gil Patterson and the condolences to the, the family of Tom McCabe. From, Tom McCabe was the first Minister for Parliamentary Business, and I think it was maybe called Minister for Parliament then, and, and, and I think he did us a great service in, in, in the, 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 the groundwork that he laid in, in that role. Um, I knew him as a member of the Finance Committee, and I think he was one, uh, one of our members who had respect right across the political spectrum, a, 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 a real honest guy and, and a real person who actually folk could trust and, and could go to if they wanted advice, irrespective of, of what party they were in. And he will be sadly missed by, I think, everyone in this chamber and those who are no longer here. Um, Ka Cameron Buchanan, I think, made um, uh, a, probably a very useful suggestion in terms of new members, um, because while it's, it's, it is important we have good, robust procedures in place, it's also important that we all understand them. So I think I, I would certainly think that the suggestion about in, improving the induction for members as one of our, our most recent new members um, into the parliament, he will most 
acutely remember what it was like to come in into this fantastic chamber, into these fantastic buildings, and um, kind of have to work out for yourself as, as, and how, how you're going to get on there. Now, I, I know at the start of a normal session there is perhaps a more orchestrated induction process for MSPs, but I, I think we should always listen to, to how, how these things can be improved. So perhaps having the Electoral Commission involved in that is, 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 a, is a good thing um, taken forward. Um, <clears throat> Mr Bibby made some points um, in terms of um, ministers, and I, I think to be clear, uh, ministers are required to, um, to register the same way as any other, other, other member. Um, so maybe also uh, asked about um, the, the law, the, our situation with lobbying, and, and while these are two very different um, aspects, particularly when we're talking about paid advocacy, um, there, there clearly is um, a, a crossover, and um, the, the government were very grateful to the committee for the work that they put into to looking at how we might take forward a, um, a lobbying register and, and I can absolutely put on record that the government is committed to introducing a lobbying transparency bill before the end of the parliamentary session and you know, that, that commitment has been reiterated several times most recently in our programme for government and the, the debate here in the, in the chamber. Um, our, our bill will continue with the process that we have, which is one of consultation, one of trying to pull um, um, everyone on side. So there will be a consultation process and dialogue with um, all interested parties. Um, we're in the process of speaking to political parties just now to make sure that when we move to consultation, we have the broadest um, consensus here in this chamber um, and, and across the political parties as possible. But rest absolutely assured that we will be bringing um, uh, that bill forward in, in this parliament. Um, Neil Bibby. Um, I thank the Minister for taking intervention. Obviously, is it, I'm, I'm aware that ministers do need to complete a minister's register of interest. Um, why is this not published online, publicly available? Um, and does he believe it should be? Minister. Sorry, ministers um, are, are have to um, fill out the members' interest. Is the parliamentary register the same as every other member? Ministers are not exempt from any of the, the parliamentary rules, and, and so that, that, that exists for, for everyone. There's, there, there isn't, that this parliament does not distinguish between members who are ministers and members who are not ministers. Um, so so that, 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 that is, is there, and it is public the same as... Um, I contacted Spice about this issue. They said the Scottish Government maintain its own register of interest for Scottish Government ministers, but that is not published. Can you, Minister. Can you shed light all, on that? All, 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 while there, there are perhaps other, other registers, and um, all ministers are obliged to um, comply with the same rules as every other member of this chamber. In addition, ministers um, go further um, in that we publish um, meetings and events, um, etc., as well. So, I mean, I, I think that there, there's, that there's a, a, a slight, you know, it's not a ministerial register because we, we register, you register um, any, you know, your interests as a, as a member in the same way as everyone else. Um, in, term, in terms of other, other, I, I, it would be very helpful if the Minister could clarify if there is a ministerial register, because that's really the point. But it, it could be, uh, and if there is, why it's not published. But there could also be an occasion where, say, a member, for example, had a shareholding in a private health company that was not registerable, registerable because it was below the criteria. Now, that might be regarded as not being an interest, but if that same member happened to be a health minister, for example, it would absolutely be an interest that people outside, and certainly us as members, would want to know about. So there can actually have to be a bit along, of a disparity please. there, and it would be helpful to have clarification. I think, I think the, 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 the kind of test is the, 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 the public test of what an ordinary person in the street would, would consider a, a registrable interest, and, and that test exams. So if a health secretary had shares in a health company, then... I think any reasonable person would see that as a registrable interest, so therefore should be registrable. However, I will go and check and see if there's a, if there's a gap someplace, then, then clearly we should, um, we should look at that. However, the point I was, I, was, I was going to come on to was that um, I, um, I think Patricia Ferguson, in, in, in her, her opening, made an, some interesting points around share, shareholdings and what the thresholds should be. 
Um, clearly, the committee's report says why it thinks the current levels are correct, but you know, I, I think there's a reasonable argument to be made about why that perhaps should be looked at again, and, and clearly that would be a matter for the committee, and uh, I can't believe you're suggesting I'm short of time. But, um, I'm sorry, I'm just now trying to protect the time for the committee closing speech. Uh, OK, sorry. Um, well, OK, just to move to, to, to summation, um, well, so there's two points I do need to pick up on. So there, there was um, some suggestion that the idea of um, a rectification procedure um, might be something that we should do, and the government would argue against any such safety net mechanism. Um, we uh, would be concerned that that idea, the notion of minor complaints, um, really should be a message that should be avoided. It would potentially provide um, confusion. And we would, again, as I said in my opening, be very much against the idea of removing away from the criminal offences being there in, in terms of probity. It's just that the, the signal that we'd send to members of the public um, would be entirely wrong. While this parliament has not been involved in any of the kind of um, mire that we've seen elsewhere, it would be sending out the wrong message at this time. So I think we would be very much against it. But, but thank you very much um, for your forbearance, um, presiding officer. Many thanks, Minister. And I now call on Margaret McDougall to wind up the debate on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Uh, eight minutes, which should take us to five o'clock, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I have enjoyed listening to the contributions in this short but important debate today. And I would also like to thank members for their contributions and the clerks for their support in preparing this bill. The convener and other committee members have already explained much of what is in the bill. And as the vice convener of the committee, in summing up the debate, I want to use my speech to cover three specific proposals. Expanding the paid advocacy offence, ending dual reporting for independent members, and retaining members' registers. As we have heard in the course of the debate, this Parliament standards regime is robust. Members take the responsibility to register financial interests seriously. However, we should never be complacent. There is always room for reform and improvement. This is what the committee hopes will be achieved by this bill. Firstly, let me talk about the committee's proposal on paid advocacy. Paid advocacy effectively means an MSP taking up a cause or matter in return for reward. I want to highlight that since 1999, no member has ever been found to breach the prohibition on paid advocacy. However, in the spirit of ensuring that the Parliament's regime is as robust as it can be, the committee proposes to extend the offence of paid advocacy. At the moment, a member has to actually receive the pay payment or benefit for it to be considered an offence. The committee's proposal will extend the offence so that it will be an offence for a member to agree to accept payment in return for, an advocating, for advocating a cause, whether or not they actually go on to receive the payment or benefit. These changes are along the lines of changes made in the Bribery Act 2010 and represent a further strengthening of the Parliament's standards regime. The second item I want to talk about is the treatment of independent members in ending dual reporting. The convener spoke about dual reporting and the committee's proposals for ending it. Section 59 of the Electoral Administration Act 2006, the section that will exempt members from PIPERA reporting once it is commenced, was intended to remove the requirement for elected members to report donations to the Electoral Commission. However, it only covers elected members who are members of political parties. In this section, it is commenced as it stands. Dual reporting would end for MSPs who are members of political parties. But independent members would still be required to report donations to both the Electoral Commission and the Parliament. The committee's initial view was that it would not be possible to end dual reporting for independent members as they were expressly accepted from the relevant legal mechanism for ending dual reporting. However, we were concerned at this since we consider it highly desirable that all members should be treated equally. 
We have therefore revisited this issue and have concluded that legislative changes should be made to allow the ending of dual reporting for independent members. The draft bill included with our report does not yet include this amendment. However, we have been discussing possible changes with the Electoral Commission and the UK Cabinet Office. Our aim is to include the necessary amendments in the bill as introduced so that dual reporting can be ended for all members. The third proposal I want to highlight is the committee's proposal for publishing and retaining the register of interests. The existing Interest Act states that the clerk shall keep a copy of old entries for a period of five years from the date of making that last amendment. This means that currently members' registers of interest are disposed of when the five-year period has passed. A number of MSPs in the initial registration process at the start of session four found that they did not consider the prejudice test applied to some of the interests they had registered in the previous session. On that basis, there was no requirement that they include these interests in their register for the new session. But, this, but, but since their old register from the previous session was no longer available to view, they felt they should include these interests just to ensure that they were, remained in the public domain. A snapshot of registers from the previous session is now available online to try and address this point. But the committee also feels that it would be helpful to amend the Interest Act to make clear that registers may be kept for a longer period. Order, please. Chambers, the registers loud. provide a history of information such as members' external employment or significant gifts to members, which is of genuine public interest. Researchers may want to access to registers for earlier sessions in the future, and it would provide a more complete picture of the Parliament and its members to make them available as a historic record. So the committee is proposing a 10-year retention period for old entries. This means, for example, that people could still refer back to the old register for a member who is not re-elected in one session, but is then returned in the following session. The intention is that old entries would only be held for the 10-year period and then transferred to national records for Scotland for historic preservation. Order, please. Could members be respectful of the fact that the committee member is concluding this debate? Gil Patterson and Cameron Buchanan talked about the committee's original proposal to remove the criminal offence for failure to register or declare an interest. The, com the committee felt... I will take an intervention. Gil Patterson? If you're well, just to correct the record, I, I made no such claim. I, that's not what I said. I said... What I said for minor offences that the Commissioner should actually look at them. And I also said, in any way, if it disturbed the, uh, the, the system itself and it wouldn't work, then I wouldn't support it. Margaret McDougall. Well, um, I would have to check the record to see what you did actually say. But uh, the committee felt that such breaches could be dealt with using parliamentary Order, sanction, sanctions, which are robust. Following con consultation, the committee took on board the point that this could be seen as making our system more lenient and decided not to change the criminal offence provisions at this time. However, as both members have raised it, there may be a case at some point in the future for considering this. You must um, so there's no now. discretion. In conclusion, I want to remind members how important it is that we have a robust and wide range of measures in place to deal with the breaches of rules. Presiding officer, the Scottish Parliament has seen very few breaches and we want to keep it that way. Extending the offence of paid advocacy, adding new sanctions for breaches, making sure that rights and privileges can be withdrawn where appropriate, all these proposals will make our regime stronger. The message is clear. The Parliament has the power to punish members for serious breaches of the rules and it will use these powers if it needs to do so. This is a comprehensive set of measures which will improve what is already a robust standards regime. The committee asks members to support this motion 
and agree that this bill can be introduced. Thank Many you. thanks. That concludes the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee debate on proposals for a Member's Interest Bill. And we now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of Business Motion 12995 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Could any member who wishes to speak against this motion please press the request to speak button now? And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion, please. Moved. Many thanks. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I will now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 12995, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Could I ask for silence? I'm going to call that vote again. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The next item of business is consideration of four business motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motion numbers 12989 to 12992, setting out stage one timetables for various bills on block, please. Moved on block. Thank you. I propose to ask a single question on motions number 12989 to 12992. If any member objects to a single question being put, please say so now. No member has objected to a single question being put. Therefore, I will now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motions number 12989 to 12992, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Motions are therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of two Parliamentary Bureau motions. And I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion numbers 12987 and 12988 on the designation of lead committees. Moved. Thank you. The question on these motions will be put at decision time to which we now come. And there are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion 12869, in the name of Christina McKelvey, on EU engagement and scrutiny of the committees of the Scottish Parliament on European Union policies 2015 to 16, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The second question is that motion 12869, 951, in the name of Stuart Stevenson, on the proposal for a member's interest bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. The next question is that motion... Order. The next question is that motion 12987, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on the designation of a lead committee for the Alcohol Licensing, Public Health and Criminal Justice Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. And the next question is that motion 12988, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on the designation of a lead committee for the Scottish Elections Reduction of Voting Age Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. And that concludes decision time. And we will now move on to members' business. Could members please leave the chamber quickly and quietly if they're not participating in the debate?